Okay, uh, I probably should introduce myself. My name's Timothy Waters. Uh, I'm a professor at Indiana University. Um, uh, first, I just want to express my thanks to the organizers for the invitation to take part in this uh, extremely interesting and important process. I think I delayed all of about one second before I said absolutely. Um, so let's get started. Uh, you know, in, in thinking about the value of a code of practice, I think it's worth remembering at the outset its real limitations, um, and, and those are political. Codes are technical, and their implementation and effect nonetheless depends on political will. And this is true in Europe as in the world more broadly, and in both those areas, territorial sovereignty is notionally a domestic matter, but the predominant sentiment is suspicious of challenges to territorial sovereignty and sees them as challenges to regional or international order. That hostility, I think, is the real challenge this prospect project faces, um, and it's the thing it has to overcome to succeed. So while my presentation and my article are contributions to the third sort of more technical part of our project, I want right now to place them into that political context because Taken as a whole, I think this project should tackle head on the assumption that territorial sovereignty disputes or TSDs are antithetical to European values uh, more generally. A formal code of practice might help catalyze that shift, but it's the shift we need to keep in focus. Our project is a code, but its purpose our real project is to radically change minds so that a code like this might make sense. So with that, I want to start by suggesting two doctrinal moves which would be critical to creating the useful space for a code of practice and for framing any European uh, intervention as legitimate. The first of these concerns how to think about subsidiarity, and the second, how to uh, interpret uh, succession to treaties. So you're all familiar with subsidiarity, and therefore you know uh, that the, set, the word secession rarely is mentioned in the same sentence. Subsidiarity is about redistributing power within a system, but secession breaks political units, so it seems very different. But when a state um, withdraws from an existing one, it doesn't necessarily withdraw from the broader regional or international order. In fact, really, secession is a repositioning within that order to give some community whatever the status a state has in relation to that order and its institutions. That sounds a lot like subsidiarity. And I think reframing secession as subsidiarity would allow TSDs to be understood and resolved within European institutions rather than as challenges to them or a withdrawal from them. And that brings me to the second doctrinal move, which is to rethink EU treaty norms regarding membership and withdrawal. So right now, a community that would, would secede from a European member also withdraws from the EU. That's how Article 50 is typically interpreted. So one of the most valuable things our work might accomplish is to change that interpretation or practice, which I think in turn would make a code uh, practically useful. And, and I think a different interpretation is possible. So under international law, right, most treaties uh, are subject to the tabula rasa principle, but humanitarian treaties presumptively continue in force, what's called automatic succession. The idea is that humanitarian treaties benefit individual human beings, not states, so the rights ought to sort of run with the land, so to speak. That's what happens with the European Convention of Human Rights, for example. Now, the EU treaty is not a humanitarian treaty, of course, but some parts of it, like its fundamental values and its rights commitments and anything necessarily connected to their operation, could be seen as humanitarian. And this could provide a basis for uh, claims about continuing membership. There's no conceptual obstacle to this, uh, to amending the treaties to provide explicitly for succession and continuation, for example, or interpreting the existing treaty as humanitarian for purposes of treaty succession after secession so that EU citizens wouldn't be derived, deprived of its benefits. Or one could simply read out the rule that we currently see there, the one that says that secession equals withdrawal. Because after all, in fact, 
Article 50 says nothing at all about secession. It refers to a member state withdrawing. And, well, at least since uh, Brexit, it's obvious that a sub-state territory might secede from a member state in order to remain in the EU. Or, or a fourth possibility, um, we know that continuator states' membership doesn't lapse. After all, in all the discussions about, say, Catalan uh, secession, the assumption is Spain would continue to be a member. Uh, um, and it would be possible, nothing in international law prevents us from treating both the seceding state and the existing one as legal continuators for certain purposes. And if we did that for EU membership, membership could continue for both. So all of this means we could imagine, for example, um, using any of these theories to devise something like conditional succession or provisional suspended membership that would preserve the essential core of membership and fundamental values and rights for the benefit of EU citizens uh, while the technical aspects are worked out to ensure a reactivated full membership. Conceptually, this is actually no different from what already happens when new states succeed automatically to humanitarian treaties. It would turn what is a highly contested political question into technical work for lawyers. Now, there are obviously extremely serious obstacles to doing any of these four things I've described. Um, if our code isn't merely technical, well, neither is the uh, EU treaty system. Um, it would require a sea change in political attitudes to interpret the treaty in this way or to change it in this way. And it's not clear to me what the better strategy is for uh, creating that change. It might be that running straight at this most political question is not a wise thing to do. But instead, building a code, as we're anticipating, could lay the groundwork for change more readily, more quickly than just tilting at the political windmill. I, I don't know. But I do know that before any code could be successful, this question, or one very much like it, will have to be answered sooner or later. And if it were answered, if it were possible to imagine the continuation as a matter of treaty interpretation, then the process of creating a code that was effective and implementing it would be uh, that much easier. I mean, ultimately, sovereignty conflicts are uh, political, and their resolution doesn't depend on codes or technical practices or anything else. Uh, it's our strategic objective that's got to be the challenging or even the undermining of that legal and political culture that sees TSDs as a problem, views them with hostility, and enables resistance to peaceful resolution, enables the state to use its coercive powers to resist even peaceful claims about change to territorial sovereignty. Now, maybe drafting a code can help focus attention on this argument that European norms of democracy and participation actually require us to rethink this reflexive commitment to existing territorial arrangements. I think it could. I also think that a direct challenge to Article 50 might help in this goal. After all, if the European Union truly believes in an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe, uh, and in the attractive force of its own values, why does it have a rule denying people who share those values the right to remain in that union? Why does it say that the resolution of a domestic political dispute in which the union notionally has no interest necessarily leads to the expulsion of one side of that dispute? Okay. I now want to turn to the code itself and suggest two framing principles for how we could devise it. First, to whom should a code be addressed? It might be strategic to frame a code as obligations on the claimants rather than on states. You know, typically, groups impose standards on themselves in order to purchase legitimacy. And in this case, the claimants are proposing to break existing states, and they're in a weak position politically. By imposing high standards on themselves, they could marginally improve their prospects for acceptance and support, at least by inoculating themselves against the easier objections. So this is what, after all, the Quebec court talked about when it was discussing the nature of recognition. It pointed out that a de facto secession might get more or less recognition depending on how legitimate the process it had pursued was. And it said, quote, uh, an emergent state that has disregarded legitimate obligations arising out of uh, its previous situation can potentially expect to be hindered by that disregard in achieving international recognition. 
On the other hand, compliance by the seceding province with such legitimate obligations would, fav would weigh in favor of international recognition, end quote. Now, the Quebec court was talking about unilateral secession, but it applies equally to the question of diplomacy in a negotiated process. Identifying high standards and then holding to them strengthens the diplomatic hand of the claimant. So instead of speaking primarily about what states must do, a code could describe what the claimants must do to be taken seriously. Okay, now second, I want to suggest that the claimants should also limit themselves in an important way. The core of a TSD is a dispute about sovereignty, not about particular rules, but about the power to make rules. The result of a TSD may well be the end of the existing state's authority, but the dispute itself is not licensed to nullify the state's laws. And claimants weaken their own legitimacy if they conflate the TSD with nullification. So I think it follows that to the degree possible, claimants should respect and obey state law and deviate from it only in the most minimal ways necessary to assert and achieve their right to contest sovereignty. So a claimant like the Catalan government that already had power under the existing legal order should have made only the most minimal changes whose purpose is to, was to make the decision itself to resolve the TSD possible, not nullifying state laws or establishing separate institutions in advance of independence. And in turn, it is this limitation upon the claimant, the obligation the claimant takes upon himself that uh, to obey the state's norms uh, that justifies the duty of the state to engage in good faith negotiations. The state can demand obedience to everything but allow just one thing, the right to contest sovereignty. Now, I grant that polite, rule-abiding behavior can be frustrating, especially when the deck is so clearly stacked against the claimant. And radicalization can be effective, just as being a victim uh, can greatly strengthen sympathy. But waiting for violations of democratic norms or for violence is not a real strategy and certainly not a very pleasant one. And it can be costly. It can actually generate more resistance than support, and it gives the state a pretext to crack down. And, and there's simply just no way to build radical confrontation into a code. In the European context, there's no good alternative to advancing a TSD claim on the basis of law and democratic principles. So I think entrenching a no nullification standard in the code actually strengthens the claim. All right, third, I, a code of practice needs to think about two different scenarios for TSDs based on existing substate units and for TSDs that propose novel units. The dynamics of a TSD in places in which there isn't already a unit are different. It's much harder to identify the territory at issue, the relevant population, and so on. Relying on existing units offers strategic advantages, but codes that are built around them exclude other plausible legitimate claims. So one possibility is to develop two separate codes, two separate processes. Another would be to develop rigorous general norms like supermajorities, but allow more relaxed thresholds where there's an existing recognized unit. But even when we're dealing with uh, an existing unit, it makes sense to think about provisions that would sort of right-size the territory to ensure that populations that don't want to exit can remain as much as possible, and that populations outside the unit that might want to exit could join it. So this means thinking about border plebiscites, or adjustments of different kinds. Each of those modifications requires us to think about populations that aren't already defined by some internal boundary. Okay, lastly, to close, I want to think of some, I'll say something about some specific provisions that all relate to clarity. Uh, I address these at length more in the comments. Just three things here the size of the majority, its nature, and the context in which it decides. I just mentioned a supermajority, and though this is an unhappy concept in Spain, I think it's important to keep it in mind. Bare majorities open up territorial sovereignty disputes to a broad range of claimants, but they also create conditions of low legitimacy. You know, the heart of such disputes are questions about who is the appropriate demos. And the strength of a claim against the state comes from being able to assert that some local majority matters. Relying on a bare majority makes it much harder to confront these objections about displacing the state level majority with a local one. And supermajorities make those objections much more effectively, uh, make you, you know, respond to them more effectively. The trade-off, of course, is that a high threshold is hard to meet. I hardly need to tell people that in Catalonia. Uh, but for this project, I think that's a risk worth taking. 
we are formulating general standards, which, if they work, provide a pathway to legitimation. There is real, eva real value in asserting that TSDs are and should be subject to norms and rules. After all, right now, the Catalan separatists face an even higher threshold since Spain rejects their claim on principle. There is no threshold, supermajority or otherwise. That's good enough. So I think we should pursue some standard. So second, whatever the preferred level of majority, it should be an actual popular majority, not just a parliamentary one. TSDs are extra constitutional, and it just doesn't do to rely on the existing constitutional order's translation of popular will into governing majorities to make a claim against that order. So the third and last point about clarity, in addition to a clear question and a clear majority, resolving TSDs requires a clear context. I think where possible, those decisions should be made in the in a freestanding referendum that not that is not part of a normal electoral process. Now, obviously, if the state is unsupportive, then using the existing existing electoral system is is an understandable strategy. It's what the Catalans did in 2014, using provincial elections to sort of do an end run around Madrid's resistance. But the result was a very ambiguous mandate, since voters, whatever they thought they were voting for, were in fact choosing a government for an existing unit inside Spain, and that is a radically different position than the bare extra constitutional question, shall we exit the state? Holding a separate referendum allows the clearest possible signal. Now, even the clearest process is going to contain enormous uncertainty in practice. Contextual clarity is not always going to be possible. Sometimes a legitimate, legitimately initiated process will devolve into a crisis, or there may just be no option except to proceed despite lack of clarity and information. But the TSD process itself, the one that we're trying to regulate by a code, shouldn't contribute to that unclear, unclear context through nullifications or uh, mixing of electoral agenda, agendas or other moves that distract from the core claim uh, contesting the state's very sovereignty. All right, well, thanks very much. And I look forward to our live discussions about this extremely interesting, creative and important project.